Dijon in the south of France. The world's car manufacturers gather to do battle. A grueling 300-mile sport car race is about to begin. Among the big names taking part, Mercedes, the hot favorite. Porsche dominated the sport for 20 years. Nissan, Toyota and Mazda, Japanese newcomers to the event. And Britain's Jaguar, currently world sport car champion and the team to beat. For all these companies, victory will bring prestige and fame. But for Jaguar, the outcome is even more important. It's part of a struggle for survival. Jaguar appears to be a company that's doing astonishingly well. But in fact, it's a, it's a company at, at risk. And the, the main danger to the company, in many ways, and perhaps paradoxically, is not the competition. It's not your BMWs, your Porsches, and Mercedes-Benz. It's the attitude of the city and the financial institutions of Jaguar. Until next year, Jaguar is protected from takeover. But after that, city institutions are expected to make a killing by selling the company to the highest bidder. It could easily end up in foreign hands. All the work and effort that's gone into that company, I think has been done on the basis of there being a long-term future. If that future is snatched away from them by the city, I think that adds up almost to a betrayal of what people have been trying to do in Jaguar over the last five, six years. Tonight, just days before Le Mans, World in Action tells the story of the Dijon race and the handicap British industry faces in taking on foreign rivals. A handicap that for many makes the real enemy not foreign competition, but the city of London. Three weeks ago, at the Jaguar team's British workshop, mechanics were working 16 hours a day preparing the two cars that would race at Dijon. Well, obviously, any race is important, and uh, Dijon is particularly important because uh, it's one race before Le Mans, which of course we won last year. So the importance of this race for us is to just prove out the team one last time before we go to race at Le Mans again. The stand on the opposite side of the pitch just rises row by row by row, and the roar just grows. Just listen to this as they come past. Feel this. Jaguar won Le Mans last year and half the other races in the series, giving the company the Constructors' Championship for the second year run. The Jaguars just can't get through. There are just so many people on the track. It's drawn to a halt directly in front of the pit. It was an astonishing achievement, given the state of the company in 1980. Then, even its buildings were worn out. Inside, Jaguar's equipment and production techniques lagged decades behind those of its competitors. The cars, too, were unreliable and out of date. Production had fallen to 13,000 a year. Even then, many remained unsold. In 1980, Jaguar lost 50 million pounds. That was the year John Egan joined the company. What he's done since has established him as one of Britain's most successful industrialists. But nine years ago, the task of saving Jaguar seemed hopeless. We found uh, a lathe of the, uh, from 1897. The average age of the machine tools was well over 25 years old. Uh, all the roofs leaked, uh, most of the floors were bad. It was really nothing had been spent in the company for over for many, many years. So it really was starved of capital investment. According to John Egan, in putting that right, Jaguar was very much on its own. He certainly did not expect help from city institutions. I'm sure that absolutely nobody in the city would have given us much chances of our survival in 1980, much less invest over £100 million pounds in the company. This is a view shared by Britain's leading independent authority on the economics of the motor industry, Garo Hrees. Back in 1979, 1981, nobody in their right mind would have invested in Jaguar. You wouldn't have got money from outside, because what did you have? The quality of the cars were, were appalling. Uh, the joke was in America, you never let your wife drive a Jaguar after dark because it was dangerous. Why? Because the thing would break down and your wife would be left alone in the middle of nowhere. That was the image that Jaguar had. So there was no way in 1980, 81, that a company like that could go to the stock exchange. It would just have been, it would just been greeted by laughter. Jaguar decided, while it had to improve the quality of the existing 12-year-old model, survival depended on bringing out an entirely new car. But the car had to be completely new. I think the badge on the steering wheel was actually the only thing that was carried over. It was an all-new car. Six days before the Dijon race, Jaguar's mechanics are making the final adjustments to the cars before loading them for the journey to France. 
from the beginning, Jaguar's recovery involved a major investment in motor racing. People probably don't realize just how far racing cars have come now in the last five years. It's now basically relying on aerospace technology. It's, it's very technical. Uh, you have, have to have many really highly qualified engineers, both on uh, the structure of the car and in electronics for all the engine management systems. And that technology immediately goes back into the road car. But in the early 80s, Jaguar found catching up with the new technology very difficult. Designing the replacement car took much longer than they'd hoped. The delay might have killed the company if improved marketing and reliability hadn't made the older Jaguars very popular in America. The company found itself shipping thousands there, and a favorable exchange rate meant they enjoyed a sudden bonanza of unexpected, almost windfall profits. The city wanted a share of these profits, and it was this which made it literally scramble to buy the company when it was privatized in 1984. In doing so, it ignored Jaguar's warnings that the profits could easily disappear. We explained that we were very much at risk on the uh, variations in exchange rates. In fact, we drew up a table which demonstrated that at something like uh, $1.90 to the pound or $2 to the pound, we'd actually be losing money. I think a lot of people took it as British understatement, but we were really trying to be frank to explain that we were in an extremely complicated industry we were very young at it. We'd only just started to make these enormous investments that we had to make to become a world-class company. So I thought the warnings were clearly there. I always realized, however, that they were not being very well listened to. There were a lot of risks involved where Jaguar was concerned. But nevertheless, those risks were totally discounted by the city in the euphoria to, 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 to suggest to their, their clients to buy these shares. And Jaguar were quite honest about this. Go. Three days before the race, the Jaguar team is at the circuit and practicing with the car that did so well last year. There's little doubt in the industry that six years' preparation has produced a winner. Despite teething problems, Jaguar's new XJ6 was also a big success when it was launched in 1986. The starting price of £16,500, dealers say it's very competitive. In the city, the new model confirmed Jaguar's reputation as a miracle company. A Jaguar they knew better and realized the city simply didn't understand their industry. I think it was difficult for the chaps in the city of London to do that because basically they weren't investing in other car companies. They didn't really often see the enormity of the task in front of them. Surprisingly, this view is shared by some experts in the city. They include the man it voted as the leading motor analyst, Stephen Reitman. The problem with the city's perception of Jaguar is that it really has very little to compare it against. There really isn't that much left of the quoted UK motor industry. So I think there is, to a certain extent, a knowledge gap about what Jaguar stands for. At Dijon, two days before the race, Jaguar and other competitors begin their practice lap. progresses, it soon becomes clear Jaguar has a problem. Despite all the preparations, they're proving difficult to handle on this circuit. I think it's very bumpy and uh, that's upsetting the cars a little bit. Every time you go over a bump, you lose down for some aerodynamics, so it's making the cars a little bit difficult to drive. Uh, we think we know how to improve it, so for tomorrow we'll, uh, we'll try some different settings and uh, see where we go from there. So, what was, I mean, as far as you're concerned... I've had a fight, I've had a fight, yeah, I tell you, it was not nice. Yeah. In 1987, Jaguar hit much bigger difficulties. In America, the stock market crashed and changes in the exchange rate put an end to easy profits. Most foreign companies, including the Japanese, suffered more, but this didn't stop the city turning on Jaguar. I was surprised. Um, that, that people um, were 
in a way, so cruel about it. I, I, I thought that we'd, we'd, we'd actually added quite a lot of, of luster to our, to, our, to our country and to our, and to our industry. And I was a bit surprised by uh, how savage a lot of the criticism was. I think the, the, the overhyping of Jaguar in 1984 can almost be the, the cause of the city turn, turning against Jaguar. Because what you had were individuals in the city suggesting to their clients that you should buy these, these Jaguar shares. So the shareholders would want to know why perhaps they had been encouraged to buy these shares by their financial advisors and analysts. Well, the financial analysts are human beings. Let's find somebody else to blame. Let's now, if you like, de-hype the company and take it down too far in order perhaps to recover some of our own tracks. I would say that that has been the case. Jaguar was a go-go stock. I think people's expectations were too high. Once those hopes were dashed, the city or a large element of the city was very uh, quick to attack Jaguar and really hit it when it was actually at its most vulnerable. I think when people come into difficulties, I think there's sometimes a propensity for people to start kissing them. It's probably a very English attitude, really. In Dijon, at the end of the practice day, the Jaguar team changed springs and shock absorbers to improve the car's handling. In Coventry, too, Jaguar is dealing with its problems. By opening new markets, they've managed to go on increasing production. They're also using new technology to cut costs, and workers are going through difficult and often painful change without extra pay. Yet profits are down, and the city remains hostile. When restrictions on buying Jaguar shares are removed next year, it's expected to sell them to the highest bidder. It'll be very tempting having cash on the table. The company really is in dust. In the 1990s, Jaguar could very well be a subsidiary of a foreign company. What are the sort of risks that you'd fear if there was a takeover of Jaguar? The problem is you don't know the motives behind uh, the reasoning of the buyer. You don't know what he wants to do with the Jaguar assets. Does he want to put the name Jaguar on a three-door hatchback? Does he want to sell uh, his products through your excellent dealer network? What ideas has he got? So it's a very difficult thing because you don't know what's on the, on the mind of the buyer. An ill-conceived takeover would be a very bad thing for the company. And certainly we had experience of being owned by uh, somebody in the past who invested very little in the future of Jaguar cars. Uncertainty about Jaguar's future is now putting the company at a disadvantage in a fiercely competitive world market. Just how competitive is clear at Dijon the morning before the race as cars leave the pits to complete timed laps. The company really is being treated pretty badly, almost like appallingly by, by the city. The moment the company hits some um, stormy waters, instead of the financial institutions in this country and the financial advice perhaps coming to, to the aid of Jaguar and saying that this is just a short-term problem, let's not worry too much about it, Quite the reverse needs to happen. What you get is perhaps people immediately piling into the lifeboats and, 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 and leaving Jaguar shares to, to be cast adrift. This, this is not what happens on the continent, where the financial institutions would take a much longer term view of the future performance and the problems that a company goes through. The experience of Porsche, one of Jaguar's fiercest rivals at Dijon, reveals the size of the British company's handicap. Porsche cars have won Le Mans 12 times. But away from the racetrack, during the 80s, the company has looked less impressive. Its model policy has been wrong, and it suffered a far bigger reverse in America than Jaguar. But the German system has helped Porsche back onto its feet, rather than making the problems worse as a Jaguar. Porsche's strength, and that of other German companies, comes from its supervisory board. It includes shareholders, workers and managers and does the job the city is supposed to do, but unlike the city, these men believe companies should be helped, not sold, when they get into difficulty. If you then have to convince your advisory board to stay with the company, it would be, for me, a disaster. It would be a nightmare. You go to the uh, advisory board, tell them the story, tell them what you are allowed to do, get the permission, then the world is okay for the company. 
because we have to go ahead, bring it out from the crisis with the step and we agreed and we stay behind you. Helped by the supervisory board, Porsche now believes it's over the worst of its problems. At Dijon, too, the day before the race, things are going well for Porsche. The privately entered British team are among the fastest in practice. For Jaguar, the story is less encouraging. I think that uh, at the moment, on this circuit, it's just a pure card, and if we could get sub the fourth, then we'd be doing very well. Anything more than that, then that's a bonus. But as a company, away from the racetrack, Jaguar's handicap is far more serious. It isn't just a problem, you see, of the, of, of the short-term problem where perhaps Jaguar is, is denied help, whereas a, a German company is, is supported through a, a short-term squall to see it through into a very prosperous long-term future. But the problem really is that they are having to devote probably too many resources to the, the short-term firefighting rather than looking ahead strategically in a way that perhaps a, a German company would. A German company knows that in 10 years' time, as long as it's viable, it's going to be there. Jaguar perhaps doesn't know whether it's going to be there in, in 18 months' time. I think in the main, what happens is that the commentators and the rest are trying to goad you into some sort of short-term action that's going to make some difference. Unfortunately, with the car company, with its long-term, well-laid-out plan, usually the short-term stuff you do will actually make things worse. So you're constantly actually swapping in your brain from one part of the thing to another. You know, really, that your plans are long-term things and you really can't divert from them. And on the other hand, you're being pushed and pushed and pushed into doing things and saying things which will actually uh, make changes in the very short term. Robust things that people, you know, are really uh, encouraging you to do. But in the heart of hearts, you know it won't make the situation better. Nothing illustrates Jaguar's disadvantage more forcefully than the story of Mercedes, Jaguar's other main competitor at Dijon. Like Porsche, Mercedes, too, has not been doing particularly well recently. Its models are aging and the company's losing market share. Profits will remain depressed until the company brings out new cars in the 1990s. Yet this hasn't stopped Mercedes pursuing an ambitious long-term strategy, even though for years it will cut profits even further. In London, the city is advising people to sell Mercedes shares. In Stuttgart, they can ignore this. They say they're investing for their children and their children's children, and that German shareholders will support them. I think the shareholders in Germany are more stable, more loyal, more patient. So uh, it is everything in a in a atmosphere like a family. We uh, work together, and we. Uh, discuss together and that is a very very good basis for uh, such plans in the, for the future the idea i think of all the german companies i'm uh, really involved with and familiar with is to secure the future and not to secure the result for the next shareholder meeting that's okay so that's one point but that's that's not the major point and not really the point the point is to secure the future of the company for 10 20 maybe 30 years and more at dijon the day before the race mercedes is doing well the team is the fastest in practice it was good it was okay fun team i'm not so sure yet uh, with the setup for the race but i hope we'll manage it yeah, I think that the, the Mercedes here will probably be the strongest as the car seems to like the circuit. It seems more suited to the bomb. So we'll just have to sort of uh, grit our teeth and, uh, and hang in there. Jaguar, life is in a race with a handicap against which it's foreign rivals. All too often, the British industry has to take the short-term view because that's what the city expects. The problem is, is that Jaguar could actually fall to one of these manufacturers because the stock market is not really assigning its true value. For Stephen Reitman, the fundamental problem is that the city values companies like Jaguar on the profits they'll make over the next year or two, not, as industry itself does, on where the company will be in 10 or 20 years' time. And they're not that bothered about the fact that Jaguar is facing problems about currency. That really is irrelevant over the long term. We're absolutely sure that when we start taking short-term 
action, we actually disrupt the rhythm of what we're trying to do. Uh, therefore, I have the feeling that if the, the management of companies are freely bought and sold on the stock exchange, typically, in a relatively small economy like the UK, we'll pull out of all the difficult products. If we don't change our system in some way, the risk is we won't have any companies of Jaguar's caliber left within the UK. At Dijon, on the eve of the race, Jaguar has still not equaled the lap time set by Porsche and Mercedes. Uh, it's going to be a very hard race. Uh, Mercedes and the Porsche are, are going very well. Uh, but everyone in, the everyone in the team, the spirits are very high, and uh, you know, they're all going to try the damnedest tomorrow to win the motor race. Of course we're going to fight because we value our independence. Uh, when things were looking very bad, I think we were a symbol of hope then. And I think, uh, I think we are an exciting company. I think we can do lots of exciting things. <laughs> about winning and anything else other than winning is just no good and uh, you know, getting beaten isn't easy and uh, I suppose if it was easy then you would never win. This weekend Jaguar will be fighting its competitors again at Le Mans. This year and next the company will also be battling with the city of London. Few at Jaguar doubt which is the bigger threat. People in the UK have got to be alerted to the present system and its disadvantages and have got to say so far and no further. I happen to believe that the, the city, it's a world-class operation itself, they should shoulder the burden of starting the big dialogue between themselves and companies like ours and the government to see what will actually help to put glue into the system and make it much more difficult for companies to be easily uh, bought and sold.